morning and welcome to the Perusia Hour. I am Shabal Race, your host, and I've got my co-hosts, uh, the Dream Team, in the in the studio. I got Salwa Elias on my right. Good morning, Good morning Salwa. Salwa. Hi, Mark. And I have Mark <laughs> Griffin in the studio as well. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, everyone. And we have a very special guest in the studio as well, uh, Father Paul Robinson. Good morning, Father Paul. Good morning, Shabal. Thank you for uh, joining us and looking forward to getting to know you and and, and the work you're doing. Thank you so uh, much for having me. Welcome, very welcome. Now. Um, uh, before we get into who Father Paul is, uh, I'd like to invite everyone who has just tuned in at 1701am in Sydney, welcome. And those who are around the world, voc.org.au, that's the link. And if you have not yet downloaded the VOC app, please do so. It's for free. It's on the Apple uh, platforms and Android platforms. And finally, those watching us on Facebook Live, welcome. We are on uh, two pages. We're on the Voice, the VocNet uh, page, the VOC Australia, and on the Perusia Media Facebook page. So welcome to all those viewers as well. Uh, I'd like to call this more like tele-radio. And so a lot of people, this has come from radio. Now we've got the televised shows. And so coming up with a word, tele -radio. I think tele-radio <laughs> sums up what we're trying to do now. So uh, it's morphing into more television, but I think it's a combo still. So uh, welcome to all the listeners and all the viewers. I am, I, I'm excited to, to announce before we start the show, Father Leo Padalinghug, he'll be here in two weeks time and he arrives on November 12 in, in Sydney. And I've got, I don't know if you can get this, but on our website, the Perusia Media website, you click on uh, his banner, you see, look for the orange banner as you scroll down and you click on that and you will see uh, the, the tour. Then eat your way into heaven. Uh, there's a bit of a, a play on words there. He is a, he's known as a chef himself, a very good qualified chef. But of course, uh, he, his, his one line is, you are what you eat. And as Catholics, we know what we eat. And we hope that uh, we can be around the table with our Lord, uh, the, the flesh, the bloody body and blood of, of Jesus Christ. So um, he talks about that. There's going to be four um, events that are, that are publicized, all there. I'll quickly read through them while I've got them in Sydney. At 6:30 p.m. On, on November 12, he will be at the um, at the Club Ashfield uh, in Ashfield on Charlotte Street. The topic is the economy of salvation, the theological presentation of money. Uh, he'll then fly off to Toowoomba. Uh, he'll be there for 24 hours, literally. He'll, he'll do a parish mission where he's giving three talks. He's giving a talk on the epic food fight, a bite-sized history of salvation. That's um, at the Holy Name Catholic Parish, uh, Bridge Street, Toowoomba. Also at 6 p.m., that's at 2 p.m. At 6 p.m., he'll be giving his second talk, One with Christ, Suffering. And the third talk will be The Logic of Sexuality, A Language of Compassion. Then he flies back to Sydney, uh, and he'll be giving a talk at St. Chabelle's Parish in Punchbowl, The Epic Food Fight, A Bite-Sized History of Salvation History, and that is at 8 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday the 14th. Then on Thursday, he has a women's retreat day. This will be our final women's retreat day of the year. Uh, they've been such a success and, and, and so um, well attended. And that one uh, will be on the, f uh, the first talk will be on the feminine genius. And the second talk will be Mary, uh, the theological, uh, theology of beauty, sorry. And that's at the Marymount Center, 36 David Road, Castle Hill, 8.45 a.m. till 2 p.m. So it's just after drop off in schools, those parents who are those mothers dropping off their kids, drop your kids off at school, come on down and you'll be, uh, it'll be finished in time to pick them up after school. So it's a day retreat and highly recommend it. Absolutely for free. Uh, we also offering um, babysitting as well, if you need that. So that's on Thursday. And then the final one, which is not here is on Thursday evening. He'll be giving a talk at 7.30 and that is in Eastwood Parish. Um, and so that's on our website as well. So look out for that. So that's Father Leo. He's back. And what I'm holding in my hand is our newsletter, our monthly newsletter. And sorry, I'm taking a while here, but the monthly newsletter, I've got the article up from the USA trip, as well as the Father Leo, uh, uh, Larry Richards. I keep mixing those two, but the Father Larry Richards and Tim Staples. So that's uh, the USA trip, then the Tim Staples and Father Larry Richards uh, tour highlights. And then we've got some uh, new resources of the month. And then thanks to our Thanks to all our supporters who are right there. If you want to get a free copy, uh, just get in touch with us at perusiamedia.com. And Mark's got the CD, which maybe we'll talk on a bit later we'll in the show. We'll come to that later on, yep. But I want to get to know Father Paul Robinson, and who's he has come, well, this morning, all the way from Goulburn, which is a bit of a drive, and, a and, and uh, outside of Sydney. Um, but even further, you've come from Kentucky, uh, USA, uh, 
That's correct. A while ago, so yes. please let us know. So you're not from Australia. Where are you from? Uh, so I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. It's okay. the biggest city in Kentucky. It's it got about, I don't know, 700,000 people. Yeah. Very, very, uh, small compared to Sydney, of course. But um, So I was uh, ordained in 2006, and then I spent th my first three years as a priest in St. Mary's, Kansas. Uh, it's just a remote town in Kansas where uh, my order has a, a big school and, and uh actually a tertiary institute as well, where, where I taught for three years. And then my superiors told me, um, yeah, we want you in Australia. So mm -hmm. um, I, I came here in 2009. I've been here uh, ever since teaching at a seminary there in, in Goulburn. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So you've been a priest now how many years? Is 12 that? years. 12 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fantastic. Um, you were you brought up a Catholic all your life? Were you born? Uh, yes, I, I was. I was born and raised Catholic. Okay. Yes, a cradle Catholic, uh, for which I'm, I'm grateful. It was really uh, my, my grandfather was a huge influence. My, my mother's father a huge influence in keeping the faith, and he was very apostolic as well. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, whenever I find these uh, apostolic people like yourself, yeah. <laughs> people at Perusia Media, <laughs> yes, it, it reminds me of uh, my own gran grandfather's zeal for the faith. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. fantastic. And so you you would have um, yeah brought up as a family um, and and practiced throughout their life a cradle Catholic and yes and did you, um and and you really uh, did you go into the semi straight out of school what was was were you I did not I did not um, so I uh, attended uni in my hometown okay. uh, after after graduating from secondary. Um, I, I became an engineer. Uh, I got a master's in engineering, mm -hmm. uh, in engineering computer science uh, and mathematics. Um, and then two years after that, I entered the seminary. So um, I don't know. I guess it's a different path for, for everybody. Um, engineers are, are very, very mathematical. They, they want to work everything out on, on paper. And uh, um, the, the vocation question, as growing up as a Catholic, I always knew that that was the most important decision in my life, um, that, that God has a plan for all of us. And we really need to figure out what his will is. And there's two, there's two main choices. Does, does he want uh, me to be a priest or does he want me to be married? Uh, those two vocational paths. And that um, I need to discern that. But my, my error, I would say, is that I thought I could um, sort of construct a flow chart. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and you put in the input, you know, <laughs> and you just follow the path and you discern it sort of on your own. Yeah. <laughs> And I realized that no, you really uh, to to find the will of God, mm -hmm. you've you've got to to enter the seminary um, and and have your vocation sort more or less discerned for yourself by people who are in a position to really um, evaluate the signs for your vocation. Mm -hmm. You can't do that on your own, yeah. And you're not going to get a phone call from God, you know. Really? No. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> While you're in the That's seminary, good. obviously you're, it's, a, it's a path of discernment. It's not just getting there. It's a path of discernment That's while right. you were there. Right. Did you ever feel at any point that that wasn't your calling? Were you ever challenged by that? Because you see so many people enter the seminary but not continue on. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because that's part of the process. That's how Absolutely. they had to find out. So did Absolutely. you ever have any doubts that this was your calling? Um, in fact, I, I, I did not. I mean, I would say it's it's more normal for people to have doubts. My difficulty was just getting to the seminary, reaching right. that stage where I realized that um, I'm not going to be able to figure this out on my own. Um, I really need to go to a seminary and have my vocation discerned. Once I made that that step and I said, I've got to, I've got to quit my job. I enjoyed mm -hmm. my job. Um, I, I've got to figure out what to do with my house and, and all these affairs. <laughs> and um, and I, I packed things up and I went to the seminary. But like I, I remember a, just a, sort of a month after being there, um, it just sort of hit me like I'm, I, I'm in the right place. I think I'm in the right yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, that's, that's something important. Those those watching or listening, uh, there's probably uh, men out there and women uh, who have a vacation to religious life. What what tips could you give uh, anyone like that who uh, is thinking or maybe have been mentioned? Uh, is it an, even an option? How do they? Where do they begin to discern uh, what God is doing for them? Um, if people are getting that sort of tug or, or, or advice, uh, you should be a priest or you should be a, a nun. What tips could you give some of our people out there listening well I mean I think the the, the main thing I would I would like to point out is it's just as Mark was saying uh, just now is that the vocation is is a discernment mm -hmm. so you're not really committing yourself to that life by entering a seminary or entering a convent you're just committing yourself to offer yourself and see where the discernment leads so I, I think a lot of people have the impression that 
um, if they enter the seminary, then it's def it's a definite thing and it's for life and so on. Um, but all that you're saying when you when you enter the seminary or the convent is that you have reasonable grounds to think you might have a vocation, yes. and you want to know um, whether yes. God wants that, and so you put yourself uh, you go to the the seminary or the convent and and you really objectively learn the will of God by doing so. And uh, there's nothing lost by that. Even, even if you spend one year, you spend a couple years, and you find out it's not your vocation, um, by being there at the convent or the seminary, you will, you will learn a spiritual life. Um, you will learn important aspects of Catholic doctrine. Um, and you will go away enriched, and, and you will be a better mother or father afterwards. Yes. So it's really, I, I think it, you, can't, you can't really lose. Uh, as such, by by trying your vocation, I think that's a great great advice. Uh, so do I. Always uh, try God first. Some, yes. Someone's <laughs> just sitting next to me. Uh, she told me that very advice before I joined. I joined the seminary in two thousand and three. Okay. Yes. In two thousand and two. So I always said you can try um, the seminary, you can't try marriage. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so you've got to give it a shot. That's and, right. And, and, and with that, I had peace and I went for it and, uh, and I spent a year in Sydney and, and about six months overseas in Lebanon and then discern. And I know for sure uh, now I've got a vocation to marriage and thanks be to God, God's blessed us with seven children and, Wonderful. and away it goes. Wonderful. And, and sort of once you give your life completely to God, he makes it clear, doesn't he? Yeah, yes, he does. What he wants for you. He does. So he really great does. Tip. So if you're watching, just give it a go. Go to the seminary and or the a convent and discern because you never know what God wants from you. Just to make sure, one hundred percent excellent advice. The number is nine six two five six triple one nine six two five six triple one. We are with Father Paul Robinson and feel free to call in as always uh, to ask any question you like. Now, Father, you have a book. I've got a book sitting on this desk here. It's called The Realist Guide to Religion and Science. You are the author of this book. The Realist Guide to Religion and Science. Now, with your background, of course, uh, as an engineer and a mathematician, and mm -hmm. um, it looks like you've, you've come from a, that sort of angle in, in trying to reach out to uh, see if you can, can they fit, can religion and science go together? Mm -hmm. And this is the great debate, uh, faith and science or religion and science. Yes. People seem to think they are very different things and they can't be compatible. Um, Tell us a little bit about the inspiration to the book and, and, and I guess that's going to be the next question. Religion and science, I mean, are they compatible? <laughs> but really, um, the, the book was inspired by some work of Father Stanley Yaki. Uh, okay. So Father Yaki was a Benedictine priest, a Hungarian uh, origin. He was a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences uh, and he, he died in 2009. Okay. Um, but he had many insights, but one of the insights he had was that, um, and I'm going to put this in technical terms mm -hmm. and then explain it later, <laughs> but that, that uh, science and natural theology have the same epistemological structure. In other words, um, they approach reality in the same way. Um, so when you do science, you've got to believe um, that you, the, the data of the senses is real. Um, and then you apply the law of causality. And exactly the same thing happens with something like metaphysics, where you try to prove the existence of God um, mm -hmm. based on reason alone. So you, you believe the, the reality of the things outside of you, and then you try to find a causally adequate answer for why they exist. And you come to the only um, effective explanation that's sufficient is, is that there is uh, an immaterial God who is sustaining things in existence at every moment. So the, the fact that, that the, the way you approach science and the way you approach natural theology is fundamentally the same indicates to us that, that not only are they not compatible, but they they're fundamentally have the, the same reasoning process. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. So we would say then what the, the critics who, who, who see good, good religion or good science uh, does look at look at these truths as um, I mean I mean you're looking at metaphysical can you explain what that is what is metaphysics and what is uh, what are these types of sciences yeah so so metaphysics is um, that d branch of philosophy that tries mm -hmm. to say what are the laws for reality as such mm -hmm. if uh, a thing is existing what must hold true for it by the fact that it exists um, so metaphysics tries to say what are those laws for instance uh, the principle of non-contradiction uh, if a thing exists it can't not exist at the same time or it can't not be what it is at the same time 
Yeah, that's, that's absolutely impossible. It's impossible for anything to exist and not exist at the same time. That's a law of reality, hard-coded into reality. Yes. Um, so the, the fact that um, both religion and, uh, or uh, what I do in my book is, is what, what uh, I say, if you observe that basic approach of, uh, towards reality where, where you accept the data of your senses and you accept these principles, these basic principles of logic and reasoning, um, then you will find religion and science are compatible. They're completely compatible. There's no conflict between the two. But if you divert from, from that way of approaching reality, which is the realist way, it's called, mm -hmm. it's, it's the epistemology called realism. If you yeah. divert from that, then you will fall into irrationality in religion and science. And, and, I, and I look in the, in, in the history in the past, um, and I see certain religions have deviated from this way of approaching reality, this, uh, having the wrong uh, theory of knowledge. And also I, I look at some aspects of modern science where modern scientists themselves are sort of violating the canons of of their own science and falling into irrationality for the same reason. And that's where, where the incompatibility comes from. But if they just stuck to that common sense approach to reality, there, there, there's absolutely no conflict. Yeah. So that's, that explains my next question, the realist guide. Who are these realists you're talking about? Yes. And, um, and, and so I noticed in the book and even on the front cover, you've got these uh, angles. And what I love is you've got these gauges of you, you go one extreme or the other or, or can you explain a little bit what you've done? You've got all yes. these little uh, graphics. Um, so yeah. far, yes, there are pictures in this book, guy. Uh, those who are listening, <laughs> and uh, we always it's like pictures, but book. <laughs> they're quite interesting. Um, and, and you've got a lot of these throughout the book. And yes, uh, can you explain yeah, well, what the idea behind that is? So um, it's, it's, it's a great, great way to. As you see, you know, in, in the discussion, the brief discussion we've had, this is this is quite sort of heady stuff, yes. and yeah. it's it's very intellectual. And one of the major challenges I had in writing the book was how do I make what I'm trying to explain mm -hmm. more understandable for the reader. Um, and so I came up with this meter, which I call the epistodometer. Um, and, and so what I say is that if you have that, that perfectly common sense balanced view of reality, um, which is called realism, then effectively uh, reality will be very lightsome for you. You'll be able to penetrate reality and make sense of it. But if you, if you deviate from it on one side or the other, um, if you either reject the, the data of your senses, okay, this, this table is not real, I don't know if it's real or what have you, or you reject um, those principles of, of non-contradiction or the principle of identity or what have you, um, then things will be very confusing and you'll fall into irrationality. So I, I use this as a way of tracking, tracking sort of intellectual balance. Um, yes. And so the, the main thrust of the book is you've got to have that balance, that intellectual balance, um, if you're going to have religion and science compatible, and also if you're going to avoid taking really extreme positions that, that effectively, I claim, would, would be irrational positions. Okay. But does an idealist fit into that bar you've got there? So the idealist would, would be someone who would take some idea that, that is, um, I don't know, they find very uh, enchanting. All right, but they haven't necessarily taken it from reality. Mm -hmm. And then they'll try to take that idea and sort of impose it on reality, okay. um, regardless of what the, the data of reality is telling them. Um, you know, so I, I take the example of, of the, um, the fundamentalist who try to say that the earth is only 6,000 years old. You know, so we have a lot of information from science, empirical evidence mm -hmm. from the senses. Uh, from geology and from astronomy uh, that, that the universe is, is much, much older than 6,000 years and the earth is much, much older than 6,000 years. But, but they've got this idea, this beautiful idea um, that, it, that it had been created in, in a 144 hour period 6,000 years ago. Mm. And so that's the only thing that can be true for them. And regardless of what the, the empirical data says, they, they refuse that data. That's, that's a great point. And that's probably where a lot of uh, division is, in, even in academia. Um, Either you go one extreme and say that uh, that the, the Genesis story of creation is a complete myth, um, yes. or you go the other way and it's so literal that people believe it's a 24-hour day, seven, seven, 24 hour, seven 24 hour days, mm -hmm. uh, which is clearly not because the sun is not even created until day four in there. That's right. Um, so what you know? How, so in this gauge, how do we how do we sum it up? Is it human history? Is that you know, the Bible? Is it talking about um, the history of humanity, and then and then well, and many many years before that, that's what the Earth is created over. Mm -hmm. Is it centuries? I mean, you know, dinosaurs they fit before then, and yes, um, 
these are probably co the most common questions you're probably going to get yes, about yes yes or that first chapter of genesis <laughs> and, uh, that's right uh, how do we how do we marry that up yes. and, and with our faith and, and how does it work and, and what does the church teach and yes and all of this uh, I, I think that's exactly the, the point for us as Catholics is what does the church teach? Yes. Because we don't go into the Bible um, at seeing the Bible as a sort of stand, standalone source of knowledge. Mm. I think that's, that's the, the problem that the fundamentalist um, that is the basis of, of their taking their position. Um, they think that, that God has given us the Bible as the source of, of all information. And so they isolate it from all other possible sources of knowledge. And they, and they won't let those sources of knowledge influence their interpretation mm. of the Bible. It's like the Bible and its text and its literal interpretation um, must be taken as, as gospel truth, um, regardless of any sort of other information that might be against that whereas we as catholics we say well what does the church say what is the how does the church guide us in mm -hmm. the interpretation of the bible so um i i took a careful look at the, really when these issues were coming to the fore in the catholic world which was like the second half of the 19th century um so the the the, the late 1800s when um, we started to find all this data from geology, uh, astronomy started to become more advanced. And the church intervened authoritatively, especially with the encyclical of Leo XIII, uh, Providentissimus Mustaeus. And, and what he, he mentions in this encyclical is that the, the Bible um, describes things according to appearances. It's meant to teach primarily uh, supernatural truths, r religious truths, um, and that in those cases where um, there is uh, a conflict, uh, an apparent conflict between uh, the data of science and a literal interpretation, um, then we must conclude that the, the literal interpretation is, is not the true sense of the Bible, uh, that we must not interpret it in, in that way. Um, so in other words, we must find this harmony between religion and, and reason, between the science and, and the interpretation of the Bible. The Bible is, is never uh, in error, um, but it's the only the correct interpretation that is inerrant. That's a good point. And yes. I, I, I was almost going to let you answer that question. We, we do say that the Bible is, um, there is no error, but, but you've got to understand what the author is trying to say. And uh, that there's senses of scripture as we talk about, the allegorical yes. sense and the spiritual sense and the literal sense. Exactly. And, um, and, and if, once people understand that, then they, they can see and, and harmonize. It's salvation history, not scientific history yes um, yes it's a good point there was a french author who said we must not make moses into a inspired precursor of newton <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we follow that line of thinking then and from creation how does this how does evolution tie into this then um and obviously there there are a few different ways of thinking has the church come down on one side of, um my understanding is it hasn't come down to say this is correct or that is correct what is the current uh, what is the current general consensus about uh, evolution and, and and how we fit into this were adam and eve created from the dust in an instant or were they evolved from a, another form i suppose before that what how does that fit in with the church's current teaching well the church's teaching doesn't change i should be careful how i say that but yes how does that fit in with what the church teaches as a strict teaching and what it actually leaves open for interpretation. Yes. Well, I mean, evolution is, is a very, very slippery word. Yes. <laughs> um, so obviously for Catholics, we're, we're not, um, if, if we want to give some credence to uh, Darwinian evolution, it cannot be as materialist. Mm -hmm. We'd have, we would have to hold that God is behind any evolutionary process if there is such a, a process. Um, so, and also, as you indicate, if, if there is such a process, uh, we must hold as well that Adam and Eve were created directly by God. Um, certainly, we have to believe that for, for everybody in their immaterial souls. We all have an immoral moral soul that has to be created ex nihilo by God. Mm -hmm. um, there's no natural process that produces human souls. Sure. Um, so, as far as the formation of, of the bodies of, of Adam and Eve, 
Um, there's certainly some, some strong um, teachings favoring the, the idea that, that God did uh, directly create the bodies, or directly form the bodies of Adam and Eve, but it's not a day fide day teaching. And um, uh, Pius XII in his encyclical Humani, Humani Generis um, in 19, 1947, I believe, um, he allowed for Catholics to, to investigate whether there might be some plausible reasons for, for holding that, that Adam and Eve um, Yes, were, they had their, they were just highly evolved, I don't know, <laughs> simians or something, and, and, and the, the, the souls were infused in them at that point. Um, myself, I'm quite skeptical <laughs> that that's what happened. Yes. <laughs> but it's not, my, my, my skepticism is on the basis of science. Um, so, mm. so the church has said this is not a, a theological question. Obviously, as we unpack Revelation, we've received the fullness of Revelation. We believe yes. that, but we don't, haven't necessarily <laughs> unpacked it and understand all of that. Do you think we will ever get to an understanding of this where the church can come down solidly and say, this is how it was, or is this just something that's going to be one of those things that's tossed back and forth for the rest of our earthly time here? Personally, I, I think something like the, the, the direct formation of the bodies of Adam and Eve is something that could be defined. It, you know, theologians speak of things that can be defined eventually or may not be defined. Um, and, and the church is not uh, against using science as, as a means to, to help her understand the deposit of the faith better or, or mm -hmm. the, the, the meaning of the Bible better. Um, but it's amazing what we've discovered even in the past 50 years. I mean, mm -hmm. just the, the, the advancements of biology, our understanding of living processes, understandings of the, of the workings of the, of the cell and genetics. Um, we, we have worlds of information that was not available at the time of, of Charles Darwin. Um, and yeah, good point. Yes, perhaps we could definitely reach a point to where it's it's fairly conclusive. I did read an article over a decade ago, actually, that science has come to the conclusion that uh, humanity began with just one male and one female. Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of gave substance to the Adam and Eve myth. Yes, right. Is that uh, was there any accuracy, any truth in that? I think there was something about the mitochondrial Eve. Uh, they, they were using sort of certain aspects of, of genetics to, to say that um, all current humans had to derive from an initial female. There's something about yes. the, how the female genes are passed on that enables them to be traced back more accurately than, than male genes. Um, I think the jury is, is, is still out on that um, as to whether the, the science is conclusive. But at, at this point, we can say that there is, uh, if, if you ever hear an atheist saying that um, there had to have been multiple first parents, um, that's not true. Science does not prove that, mm -hmm. that the, the so-called polygenism, mm -hmm. the idea that, that the human race is derived from multiple first parents. Now, we have to believe as Catholics that we all come from Adam and Eve. Um, that's what that is a, a teaching of the Catholic Church. So we we hold the monogenism as a teaching of of the Church, yeah. And we expect we expect that science will support that. We're going to have our uh, first break. We're here with Father Paul Robinson, the author of the Realist Guide to Religion and Science. Uh, we'll just have a short break, and this uh, uh, as we go to the break, Father Anthony, and I can't read it from here, but Jess, I uh, need to help over here. But Father Anthony Jeremy. is going to share his. Uh, my encounter and don't go away we'll be back shortly as a priest one of the sacraments that we administer quite frequently is the, is the anointing of the sick and I've, I've been a hospital chaplain I've worked in one of Melbourne's major hospitals and I anointed quite a number of people there. But the most dramatic moment for me happened in my early years of priesthood, where I was asked to visit a man who was dying from leukemia. He had a quite a virulent form of leukemia, and the doctors believed that this man would not see the weekend out. So I was called on the Saturday afternoon. I went in and spoke to this man, and uh, he was informed that he was dying. And so I was asked to give the anointing of the sick. So I gave him the sacrament and I had members of the family who were with him. He was a younger man in his early 30s. Uh, he and his wife had one child and they didn't expect him to see Monday morning. So he was anointed. 
and that was over 30 years ago. That man is still living and he and his wife had another child. It's an extraordinary event. And as a young Jewish doctor said to me that afternoon after I was leaving the hospital, he said the only way he will survive this weekend is if he has a miracle. He will need a miracle to survive this weekend. 30 years later, he's a miracle. when he was on uh, my encounter every Wednesday 8 a.m. on our YouTube channel you can see a new uh, testimony the day when Christ became real in your life and that's what that that series is and thanks be to God being airing uh, through EWTN as well on the platform and of course uh, every day on YouTube on the Perusia Media YouTube channel you can see all of these videos and of course since coming back from the United States we we're pleased to announce that uh, the two bookmark shows are, are airing on EWTN. As we speak, Robert Haddad, his um, bookmark with Doug Keck has been aired. And last week we had Father John Flutter, which was great. Um, and they've been, they were great shows and they were filmed in Sydney. And they were only a few months ago, if you remember, if those who follow us. And if you have not yet, put your email in our homepage, get on the Perusia Media website, put your email and you'll be up to date with all that's going on. And don't forget to register for Father Leo Padalinghug. That's tour is coming up in two weeks time i emailed you the schedule by the way for ewtn programming oh yes so we should send that out uh, in the next uh, day or two Mm. and and so month by month it's a it's a monthly schedule that that's on ewtn for free around the world on your smartphone you can download the app for free i love the app it's got the bible on there uh it's got the daily readings it's got uh it's got the, the the live streaming of tv radio and even a library of all of the documents of the church you can you can read it all there watch view uh it's even in multiple languages as well so yeah. all of the, the ewtn uh, shows are there so highly recommend it ewtn.com or download the app on your smartphone continuing here with father paul robinson uh, yeah, very interesting topics and a lot of questions that uh, I guess people have. And mm-hmm. uh, we've been touching on um, creation, evolution. Now, uh, love to talk about this this other theory, uh, geocentrism. Now, uh, it's sort of the, the people out there that uh, are debating whether um, the you know, the universe is is revolving around the Earth. Now, do you know, could you explain to our, our viewers and listeners what geocentrism is and 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 where does this come from? So I, I actually cover uh, geocentric theory in chapter seven of my book, and, and for me this is an instance of uh, something that's fairly common today, and and this is the the fact that um, because of the confusion today, there's so mm-hmm. much confusion out there. Um, things that that have long been settled seem to be brought up again as as not being settled. Um, and I, I think scientists are partly to blame for that. And um, the reason is because we, we all see, we, we sense that today science has become politicized, um, that it's being used to uh, ra- basically ram down our throats a, a materialistic agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, and this makes people lose trust in science. And they begin to say, well, it, it, does anything that science tell us can we trust any of it at all? Yeah. You know, um, so uh, basically, I- I- in the world of science, uh, geocentrism is has been debunked um, for a couple hundred years, and, and the the mountain of evidence of scientific evidence uh, against geocentrism is extreme. Um, you would basically have to to throw out all the, all the the canons, the accepted canons of Newtonian uh, gravitation. Einsteinian relativity and what have you to, in order to support a geocentric universe. Um, I, I speak of, in, in my book about something called stellar parallax, um, which, is, which is quite, for me, quite fascinating. And, and this is, um, if I could just explain this briefly yes, yes. As, as a basis, just one piece of evidence. And that is if, if, you, if you hold your, your finger up and, and you, you, you close your left eye, um, you will see your, your finger on one side and you close your right eye, you know, you will see your finger shift a little bit. To, to the right, and that's because of the distance between your eyes. You're looking at it from a different angle. 
right okay yes, yes. so it, if if the earth is is going around the sun and and we have the earth in january and we're looking at a star and then we we go and we look at the the same star in july you know we would expect to see a little bit of a shift in the star because you're looking at it from from a different angle right yes in a yes. different position and with respect to the star um so that's called stellar parallax um and at the time of galileo um, the telescopes, were, they, they were brand new, they were just the first telescopes, and they were not sufficiently powerful to detect any shift in the stars. Um, there, was, there was no shifting at all. Um, and they, you know, the St. Robert Bellarmine and, and, and the Jesuits at the time were saying, well, you don't have enough evidence to support heliocentrism. We would expect to see the shift, and we're not seeing it. But later on, when the telescopes developed um, in the 1800s, um, they did, they were able to detect these, this shift in the stars. And, and now uh, with our telescopes, we can see this little bit of a shift uh, depending on the, 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 the cycle of the year um, for stars that are within 500 light years distance from, mm. from the Earth. Um, so the fact that we can detect this is, is powerful mm. evidence uh, for heliocentrism, one of the pieces of powerful evidence. Now, what the geocentrists do is 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 they re-rig the universe. Okay, they arrange all <laughs> everything so that effectively you obs observe the same phenomenon from the Earth. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, but what they must do in addition to that, that's not sufficient to prove geocentrism. What they must do in addition to that is explain what physical forces are actually causing um, that the universe to be arranged that way. Um, and of course they can't do that and there's no mathematics behind it. So um, in other words, there's no real science behind it. Where does it come from? What, what, what inspires uh, that sort of thinking that, yeah that idea well again it's it's this uh problem of of isolating the bible and, and taking it as a standalone piece of uh of knowledge um and which you must use to correct all other knowledge and not balancing the bible with um other pieces of information that you mm. might have especially the teaching of the church so there are some uh passages of the Bible that speak of, of the, the earth remaining firm, the earth being stable, or um, the, the, the earth, yes, being central to a certain degree. Um, now, Father Yaki would, uh, he, he said, pointed out that um, the, the Old Testament is, is mainly intending to indicate God's consistency in his running of the universe. When, when um, the Bible speaks of of the stability of the earth or the stability of the world, um, that it's firm, it shall not be moved. It's speaking about the way God runs this universe in a very consistent manner. It's not, it's not wanting to say that the, the earth is the center of the universe. Yes, good point. There, there are so many questions that we could ask. We're going to uh -huh. need to get you back, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Just following on from what you've said, s science as a study needs a perspective. Is it fair to say that the only perspective that we can rely on as accurate is religion or is God. So without God included somewhere in that study of science, you're going to get all of these different solutions to, to questions that are raised and that it needs. I mean, you gave the examples of, of if you look through one eye or the other, it's a matter of perspective, what one's seeing, what the other's seeing. And I suppose if we associate that back with a, an understanding of the Bible, and then you go down the path of the Protestant Sola Scriptura, they don't have the perspective of the traditions, the magisterium of the church. So with, from their perspective, everything looks different. Is science the same way that it actually, it's not religion or science, religion and science must go together? Can you take it that far? I, I don't think you, you can take it that far. You, you, you don't have to um, believe in God to be able to evaluate evidence and, right. and find evidence. Um, so you don't have to, to be a, a believer necessarily to, for instance, find out fascinating and true things about the universe. Um, what, what I claim in the book is that um, realism is the only uh, epistemology or attitude towards reality that can make sense of us knowing anything at all. Sure. And by the fact that realism um, can prove the existence of God. If you're a realist, you will believe in the proofs for the existence of God. Um, and also you will hold the canons of science that it only makes sense. It's only sort of uh, consistent 
to to be a believer if you're if you're believing the empirical evidence. It's one it, it's one thing to say, oh, I've just made an amazing discovery, but what use of that if you can't apply it to anything? So what I'm talking about is the perspective to be able to apply that discovery that you've made, that thing that you've come across, to something useful. How do you, how do you make that useful? Yes, and I mean modern scientists like like Lawrence Krauss. We'll, we'll say things like um, why questions are forbidden. You know, we can't ask why sure. questions. And, that, and I think that's perhaps what you're indicating is yeah. that um, science is not able to give us the ultimate answers. And we deserve to, to have those ultimate answers. We want to know those well, we're searching answers. for it. Whether yeah, we're, we're a scientist or not, we're all searching for the ultimate truth. Yes. <laughs> yes. And every single one of us, I mean, it's just part of our human nature. We're going to try to give an adequate account for reality. And, and the fact is that materialism is totally bankrupt. It cannot give the, the ultimate answers. Sure. It can only tell us about how things move. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's just a little bit of piece of information about uh, the world around us. Yeah, very good. The, the, the other, the other um, I guess, theory of we've also heard, you've got geocentrism and um, there's the world is still a debate on some people saying that the world could be flat. Now, this is, I mean, those, we know the science I was pretty, I'm pretty sure the science is settled, but but of course there's still a couple of people making the case that it could possibly be fact. Can you, have you heard of this? Yes, uh, I, I, you know, modern day believe it or not, Charbel, Bell, I was talking to somebody on Sunday uh, <laughs> who was telling me that he believed the world was, was flat. Um, and, and again, for me, it, for me as a priest, I mean, sort of pastorally, yes. this is a manifestation of the great distrust that people have today about the scientific establishment. Mm -hmm. um, and so they easily latch on to certain conspiracy theories. Like they, they, it's just a, a plot to deceive us. All of, all of science is a plot to deceive us. Um, and they find some sort of spiritual value in believing that the earth is the center of the universe or uh, that the earth is flat, for yes. instance. Yes, it, again, the, the flatness of the earth is, is based on, on a very uh, literal reading of scripture. The, the scripture describes the earth as, as being planted on foundations, is, is like having columns and things. Okay. Yes, is being surrounded by water, um, uh, the, the great abyss and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the flatness of the earth was, uh, that, that, that's not just um, been revealed, the, the debunked by modern science. Um, the Greeks themselves knew that the earth was not flat um, they, by two reasons. Um, they would look. They would be standing on the on the shoreline of the ocean, and they would look at a ship off in the distance. And when they looked at the ship, they would only see the top of the ship mm -hmm. at first, and only uh, after time would they see the bottom of the ship as well. So that meant that the, the ship was coming over a curve. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then the second reason was the the lunar eclipse. They understood that in a lunar eclipse, the shadow of the Earth is being cast on the moon. Um, and the shadow is, is round. It's a rounded shadow. It's a yes. rounded shadow, yes. So um, there's, there's uh, yes, it, it's, it's not a reputable scientific opinion. Yeah. No, no, it's interesting what, I mean, truth now is, is, is being debated right now. Truth for you, truth for me. And, and, yes. And, uh, and, and even people are using science to sort of, the word science, to, just to sort of dictate their, their idea of truth. Um, th this culture right now, I mean, how did we get here? Uh, how did we get to this point? Uh, is it the, the is it the breaking up of of religion and science? Uh, literally putting a, a rift between the two, and then science without God goes off. Um, it is a to, trust to, issue, to like Father thing. said. It's I a think. trust issue. We don't trust anyone anymore. No. Yes. Um, we trust our priests, and even that's questionable now. Yeah, it is. Yes. I think we've we've just lost our our bearings. Uh, we've really lost our bearings as, as far as just uh, common sense. Um, we've we've lost realism <laughs> in my yeah. mind. It's, it's it all goes back to a philosophical problem. We've lost um, the human way of evaluating evidence and and judging reality. And our our modern communications have not helped because mm. someone who believes in the flat Earth can go on a website that will give them a hundred reasons why the Earth is flat. Or, or someone who believes in geocentrism can can go and find websites that, are, that have all these arguments. And the, and the thing is, they're not equipped to evaluate those arguments as being true or false. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if, they, if they're already leaning in that direction, if they're already sort of the conspiracy minded, um, they will naturally believe that over other evidence. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Does Steve Hawking have any place in your book, Father? Um, I, I do mention Hawking in, in um, 
chapter nine, and when I when I speak about the a materialist account of the of the origin of our universe, where where they try to source um, our whole universe from effectively nothing, <laughs> what they call nothing, um, which is uh, they they they. Th this is one of the reasons why science today, I believe, is is disreputable, um, and why people don't trust it. I mean, the things they're expecting us to believe that there are if you have to, if you take empty space. And it, which is a quantum vacuum, and you have fluctuations in that quantum vacuum. There's there's like an energy field in there, and that the particles will pop into existence um, from that that energy field. And they say, well, whole universes can pop into existence from nothing, from fluctuations of this quantum vacuum. And you're just like, really? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nothing um, from nothing. <laughs> well, this might. I mean, it might be the classic um, time. I know it's it's hard with a few minutes to go, but what sort of um what could we give what little tools can we give our listeners of course this is a whole toolkit right here um, but a little taste of how how can we be sure um god exists uh, and now i can't do it in a few minutes but what could what little what direction can we go how do we um help? i mean you start off with richard dawkins in here and, and dawkins and, and there's a few other angles but but the general the person in the pew the, the general listener um those who are debating whether God is real or not, the agnostic, um, where, where can we go? How, how do we know God is can exist? I mean, how, just from... Well, I, I mean, I, I would say everything is, is pretty much evidence of God. You yes. know, if you if you scratch nature to any degree, you, you find an order and complexity there that boggles the mind and which cannot be reproduced by even human intelligences. Um, but besides that, the, the fact that, that we are limited beings, we are finite beings, we are not self-existing beings, um, there has to be some being who is able to give things to exist at, at each moment. Um, we can't do that. You know, we are obviously um, sustained in existence. We must be sustained in existence um, by, by some uh, being who, who is able to, to be omnipotent and, and make things be real. Uh, why is there anything at all? Mm -hmm. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? Um, there are those why questions again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and we want to know the answer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we we know we are here. Yes. And we can't exactly sort of undo that. <laughs> we're here. No, we're and, here. And as angry or as you might be, <laughs> you can't change that reality. And the mm -hmm. only adequate explanation uh, for us in our in our limited state is is that there is a being who is is making us to be here, is making us not to be nothing, who is sustaining us, who's giving us existence, um, and from there we can go on to to um, also understand uh, the characteristics of God as, as being omnipotent, being all good, all loving. Yes. Excellent. As a Thomas yourself, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas offers five proofs of the existence of God. Yes. Those, uh, can you rattle them off for us, just the five, without going into detail? But, um, just there are five <coughs> proofs that he talks about, and yes. we, and, and do you touch on those here at all? I, I touch on the, the major one in, okay. in chapter two. Yes, okay. for me the clearest. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What, That's what you mentioned earlier at the beginning. I noticed. When you were explaining your book, I thought, yes. oh, this is Thomistic. I yes. remember learning this. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Very good. And what yes. was that for our listeners or viewers? So, so there's okay. there's the proof from motion. Um, there's the, the proof from causality. Um, yep. There's proof from necessity and contingency. Yes. Uh, and there's the proof from the order of, of beings, the or, uh, degrees of goodness uh, yes. and, and uh, other attributes. And then there's the proof from finality, the fact that uh, things are directed towards an end, like irrational things are directed towards an end. Um, and there must be some being who has directed them towards that end. Fantastic. Yes. There you go. And at this point, for all the viewers, you get at the bottom of the screen to be continued. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, we could delve into this. Well, how can they uh, get into your Facebook pages and communicate? So we might ask uh, uh, Jess, who is there, to uh, pop on the screen. Fathers, you have a website, I understand. Yes. Uh, how to get in touch. So let's, there's a Facebook page, a Twitter page. Mm -hmm. Um, let's pop that on how do we so what is the website uh, for the listeners what the website is the realist and the realist guide there's a contact page there if okay. people want to ask me questions uh, feel free to ask me questions fantastic um, you visit us on on Twitter or Facebook as well is that the realist uh, what's the handle on, on Twitter the handle on Twitter is guide realist I guide believe realist. Okay. yes the guide oh, realist yeah. 
A Catholic okay. realist. The Catholic realist. All right, the Catholic realist. Sorry, <laughs> we're getting we're getting our cues from our from our control room here. Um, here's the website. So here's the website. Those who are watching, you can see it. Those listening, the website. Uh, has the book the realist guide to religion and science mm -hmm. you can subscribe so you people can pop their email in and uh, and be in touch um, fantastic the realist guide trailer there's yourself and talking about it excellent as we're scrolling down through and good reads in Cora as well on there and then yes. fa Facebook as well um, there's a page what are we talking about here the book oh yeah sorry it's $40. $40 to get this book. It's a very thick book, over very 500 thick. pages. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bargain for what you get in it. Um, get on the website and it's all there. $40, that's a special price actually. I know it used to be over $50, right? $52 that's right. That's right. elsewhere. So $40, um, which is a great price for, for a book this size. So that's the website there. Mm -hmm. And there's also, and the Facebook, would that be the same as a Twitter? That, the Facebook page, is it the Yes, one? yes, they're related, yes. Okay. And we had a book launch for you at Our Lady of Lebanon yes, we earlier did. this year. Yes, yes, that was great. For those yeah. who attended, this is the same Father book and Joseph the same Father Paul Robinson. Yeah, the, <laughs> Father Joseph is the, the yeah. doctor. Father Joseph is easy as well. Yes. Father Johanna, those yes, who know him in the Maronite right. Church, uh, endorses it and, and doing great work. Thank, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Shalom, for having, having me. You. I really appreciate and it. And we have to be in touch, obviously, uh, and, and have you on again at some point so and maybe I'd even. Uh, some lectures around the place. We'd love to, mm -hmm. to see you and if we can gather some faithful together to, to learn more about this topic. Very, very important. How long are you in Sydney for, Father? Well, oh. I, I actually have to get back to Goulburn today, oh, so okay. <laughs> I have to run back. Okay, well, yes, thank you very much. Golden. We're with Father Paul Robinson, and I highly recommend to get on the website and get in touch with him via Facebook and Twitter. Um, don't forget to register for Father Leo Padalinghag. He's here on November 12th. Um, all the details on our website. Ma, uh, yep, right now you can see Eat Your Way to Heaven, um, and that is Father Leo Padlinghag, November 12th to the 15th. And get on the website, register. It's all events are free, and just put your pop your email in, and that way uh, we know how many uh, we can expect. And sign up for our CD of the month. Just really quickly before we finish the CD of the month, for those watching, you can see I'm holding it up now. Uh, the Life of Padre Pio, Pray, Hope, and Don't Worry, uh, presented by Matthew Arnold, basically takes you through the story of Padre Pio's life, his sufferings, uh, um, basically the, the miraculous um, uh, stigmata that he carried, and it goes through in detail and, and, and talks about that. It's really, really interesting. So that one's been sent out to all the subscribers to the CD of the month uh, just this week, so they should get that shortly if they haven't already. And if anyone wants to subscribe to that CD of the month, uh, visit uh, the Perusian Media website, uh, perusianmedia.com. All that contact details are there, or, or contact us at the office. So Excellent. Beautiful. Excellent. Fantastic. We are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salwa. Um, and thank you, Mark. And, thank you. and Father, before we go, would you mind giving all our viewers and listeners a blessing as Absolutely. we close? And before we do that, after that, the uh, video will be um, Katrina Zena. Somebody think at Katrina Zena. Yeah. So we close with this blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, Patris, Efiri, et Spiritus Sancti, de Shinat Subovos, Mani and Semper. Amen. 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 Amen.